please welcome Tom Siebel, CEO of C3 AI. These are the organizations. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in this event. We have, I think, 310, atten 310 attendees from 138 organizations representing 22 industries from you collectively uh, employ 3.5 million employees uh, and generate in excess of $2 trillion in revenue with market capitalization uh, in excess of $6 trillion. Um, we've been at this adventure now for 13 years. In the last 13 years, so I'm going to reflect upon the last 13 years. I want to talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit about this digital journey that we've been on. We'll see if I survive this. But in the last 13 years, okay, we have been engaged with you and others in 20,000 meetings, okay, in Paris, in Rome, in New York, in Springfield, in St. Louis, and in Washington, D.C., Copenhagen, London, you name it. We've met with over 1,500 companies, uh, 300 CEOs. I think I've probably met with 300 CEOs. Okay, and you know, I, and you'll recall that you know, and, and as we did this, beginning in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, there was this constant refrain. I mean, something had changed. Because, you know, I can assure you, when we did, you know, mainframe computing and mini computing and introduced enterprise application softwares to, to market and relational database technology to market, the CEO was no place to be found, right? This was all managed by the CIO. All of a sudden, every meeting we go into, you know, the CEO is at the table pounding on the table, mandating, and he or, thing, he or she is mandating this move towards digital transformation. I found it very perplexing. Like digital transformation, as opposed to what? As opposed to analog transformation? I mean, what does this mean? Okay, and, and so I gave some thought to that. You might recall that I wrote this book, you know, uh, called Digital Transformation. We really thought well, really what this was all about was the, <clears throat> was about these new vectors of information technology that were changing everything about computing in the 21st century. And these vectors included you know, elastic cloud computing, big data, the internet of things, and predictive analytics. And they kind of came, and where these vectors converge, we find this phenomenon called digital transformation. And why is everybody so concerned about it? Because it's becoming, a, because it's becoming existential. And we look at, you know, in, you know, in the first, you know, a couple decades of this century, you know, half the Fortune 500 companies have disappeared from the list. Okay, and predictions are the next 10 years, you know, 40% of those that will remain will be gone. And there are being, you know, companies that used to sell in storefronts are being, you know, we have companies like Amazon. Well, what is Amazon all about? 10,000 retail outlets closed in the United States alone last year, 10,000. And what is Amazon? Amazon's all about Big data, the Internet of Things, okay, and you know, targeted at retailing. Or how about Tesla? What's Tesla all about? Tesla and Uber upending the transportation industry. It's about big data, cloud computing, okay, predictive analytics on wheels. And one industry after another is being disrupted. So this is about survival. That's why the CEO's at the table. That's why the chairman of the board's at the table, because they're losing their jobs. And they're losing their companies. You know, and how many CEOs have been gone over this period of time? I mean, they're, they're dropping like flies, okay? IBM, GE, I mean, come on, GE? Uh, Yahoo, Cat, Pivotal, I mean, you name it. I mean, you, there's, there's like, the, it's a bloodbath out there. Dansk, Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank goes to a CEO like, you know, every six months. And so I've been thinking about what's been going on. And, you know, Stacy and I were watching this movie the other night um, with uh, Bob Fosse, you might remember, called All That Jazz. And it has all these comedy stints with, with uh, somebody playing the role of Lenny Bruce. Okay, and they talk about, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, on death and dying. And she talks about, you know, the, the they talks about, the, they talks about, oops, let me get this right. Did I get this go to a backward mark? Yeah, I can. Where, where you know, he talks about 
I think the five stages of grief. There's a lady in Chicago, man, wrote a book, Dr. Kubler-Ross with a dash. This chick, man, without the benefit of dying herself, has broken the process of death into five stages. Anger, denial, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And so, you know, I think there's some parallels between what they talk about with, you know, dealing with grief, with denial and anger and depression, accept bargaining, you know, acceptance. There's some parallels to what this digital journey that we've all been through in the last 12 years. And I think the parallels when we look at the digital journey in terms of we have this mandate to go digital, right? And we look at the parallels, I think there were kind of five stages of the digital journey that I want to describe. And this was about first about cognitive computing, and then about developing a digital strategy. And then, we, of course, we had to go through the stage of having to build a data lake. And then we had to move to the cloud. And then finally, we have digital transformation. And so let's look at cognitive computing. Think back not that long ago, OK? And cognitive computing, this was all about IBM, I'm sorry, IBM Watson and GE Predix, and how many scores of billions of dollars were spent on these efforts. And if we look at Predix, remember Predix was all about, what did they invent? They invented the idea of uh, <coughs> the digital twin. So everything was about the digital twin. Okay, 10 years, $6 billion, so you could build a digital twin. And you know, this was driven by um, you know, some friends of ours at General Electric. And, Part of that is rethinking the architecture and applying a new style of where the value creation is. And we believe this idea of a digital twin will be at the center point of everything. A digital twin of your transportation network, a digital twin of your water system, a digital twin of your power plants, a digital twin. We think even when you think about the future 50 years from now, every human will be born with a digital twin. And all that information we collect from these healthcare devices will go in it and help us predict and prevent a problem in a power plant, or quite honestly, we think in a long time, a, power, a problem with a human. How many people bought that line? I mean, remember that everybody was building a digital, digital twin, right? How many of their transportation, I was on the telephone not that long ago, with the CEO of a company of France who wanted us to build a digital twin of the human bio. I mean, come on, really? Digital twin of the human biome? Before you can build a digital twin, somebody needs to understand what it is. Um, and so this was all that. And this was, you know, GE was reinventing itself as a digital company with partnerships with Apple and Microsoft and Siemens and company after company. Exelon was, you know, building a digital twin of the power grid in the eastern United States. And, you know, partnership and partnership and partnership and billions of dollars. And then, well, this didn't quite end so well. They tried to sell it off, you know, for pennies on the dollar, and nobody would buy it. Zero dollars is what they, what they got for GE Digital. And, you know, so we invested you know, in this. GE invested 10 years in this, $6 billion. This is aside from what we, aside from what we invested, OK? And I believe not one successful GE Predix application on the face of the earth. And one of the world's most iconic CEOs takes the dive over this. Then even better, we get to Watson. I mean, this is kind of a parody, but it's, I mean, it's kind of painful to watch this stuff now, OK? But come on, we all bought this line of stuff, OK? And this was, and this was, this was put together by some of the best marketing people in the world. You know, where, you know, Watson Health, we we're going to replace the physicians, and we we're going to do it at Johns Hopkins, and we we're going to do it at Mayo, we we're going to do it at MD Anderson, okay, and we were going to, you know, kind of one success story after another. Bob Dylan, to improve my language skills, I've read all your lyrics. You've read all of my lyrics. I can read 800 million pages per second. That's fast. My analysis shows your major themes are that time passes and love fades. Well, that sounds about right. I have never known love. Maybe we should write a song together. I can sing. You can sing? Do bebop, bebop a do. Do be do be do. Do 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 be do. Come on guys, we all bought this stuff. 
Okay, hundreds and hundreds of projects, right? How many succeeded? I mean, did one succeed? Did one? Okay, and then, and then we saw kind of the end coming as this thing kind of crashing down around it. Okay, where you know MD Anderson, you know, collapses and Johns Hopkins collapses and Mayo collapses and you know and State Farm collapses. Okay, and now you read well, whatever happened to Watson? And I think it's got sold off for a few pennies on the dollar to a private equity firm. And, and if it's in the market, it's not apparent. You know, one of the great, uh, one of the great information technology stories really of all time. You know, so what was the net result? You know, a couple of decades, scores of billions of dollars spent. Okay, not one successful project and another iconic CEO takes a dive. Okay, so then we're now in a state of denial. I mean, this can't possibly tr be true. We've invested all this money, we've invested all this time, we've invested all these years, and we've invested with one of the uh, most iconic companies that had the CEO on the table looking us straight in the eye and said, trust me. Well, how'd that work? Oh, no, it's not me, man, no. <laughs> no, not somebody else maybe, but not me. Oh, no. <laughs> so we get to denial. Okay, so we'll pick up the pieces. And now we need a digital strategy. Okay, so we're gonna bring in, you know, the consulting organization is our choice to put together a digital strategy. And it's gonna be all about the data. Okay, and it's all about, we're gonna go agile. And we're not gonna do waterfall anymore. So we're all gonna be agile, you remember this, okay? Okay, you can come on. And you got all of the agile books, you had your scrum teams, and that was gonna make everything work. And we're gonna do like 10 proofs of concept, who did this? Everybody did this. I mean, I won't ask you to raise your hand because it's everybody in the room. Okay? And, and I know it, and I was there, and I was with you. Okay? And business is on digital. We're going to put this down into the business unit. We're going to do 10 proofs of concept, and, and we're going to be agile. And, uh, you know, how'd that work out? You know? And so we used, you know, the technology of Teradata, and Ateza, and Cognos, and DataRobot, and Dataiku, and Tableau. SAS was kind of very big at that time. Alturix for the citizen data scientist. And you know, we had 10 projects in four years. And how'd that story end? You know, hundreds of millions of dollars spent, four, five, six years wasted, no ROI, and a bunch of failed projects. So now we get to the point we've, we've made it through, you know, we've made it through cognitive computing. Okay, we, we, we survived, maybe. Okay, and we tried this, that was gonna be the cure, and you know, this, how, how'd this work out? Now we're at anger. Jesus Christ! <laughs> Goddamn son of a bitch, pig fucking bastard! <laughs> okay. So what's the next step in this journey? The next step in the journey is it's all about the data, right? Okay, and somebody, some genius who, you know, remembers from their introductory to computer science class that they took when they were a freshman somewhere, the garbage in, garbage out. So we gotta, we gotta fix that garbage in, garbage out problem. So we're gonna, so we're going, so we're going to build an enterprise data lake. We're gonna build a unified federated data image for Schlumberger. We're gonna build a unified federated image for, for, for the Department of the Army. Okay, or, or DOD, or Exxon Mobil. Good luck, I mean, so good luck. It was what years at that, okay? We brought in the consulting organization of our choice, okay, that billed us, you know, $10 million a year, or you know, 20, up to 20 million euros a year for four, five, six, seven years before you got to the change orders. And how'd this story end? Okay, with Pivotal and Exadata, you know, Cassandra, Palantir, Hortonworks, do they still exist? I don't think so. And the that might still be around. Vertica, don't know what that is. Cloudera, not sure if they're around. Terra data, if they're around, they don't matter. IBM D, okay. Uh, but you know, these were the technologies. Hey guys, this is a non-tractable problem. How many companies succeeded at building an enterprise data lake? It really, how many companies? That would be zero. This is a non-tractable problem. You're gonna build a unified federated data image for the Department of the Army? Good luck. You know, and we have these ideas of these you know, ontologies and lineage and provenance and, you know, companies would, you know, somebody learned ontology when they were like a junior in, 
you know, in, in college someplace at Princeton, so they talk about ontology, 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 and you're supposed to be impressed. Uh, you know, we got these messes, these hairballs that look like this. And, and, you know, how many companies, how many companies succeeded building the enterprise data lake? I mean, which one? I, yeah, I, which one? I think that, you know, so we look at these data breaks, have billions of dollars spent on these efforts, you know, over the period of a decade. I think there are zero successful projects, CEOs, well, I think, you know, so now we're at, you know, we've gone through denial, you know, we're going digital here, we're at anger, and now we're, now it's like hopeless. Okay, so all along comes along the life preserver that's gonna save us all, and it's the cloud, right? Okay, and we have these leaders come along, and we, by the way, great invention, powerful technology, but the cloud is gonna save everything, and we're gonna put everything in an S3 bucket, and all of our problems are gonna go away. Yeah, good luck, okay? And so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna take, you know, uh, S3 or Dynamo or Redshift or, you know, Azure Data Lake, Apache, uh, HDFS, uh, uh, in a distributed file system, or data IQ, a data robot, and that's gonna like cure this problem. So now we're gonna do these science projects, okay, where now we don't do, instead of doing 10 uh, proofs of concept, we're doing 100 proofs of concept, and by the way, there is no customer that we have that didn't go through every one of these phases. Okay, not one. 100% of my revenue last quarter, it came from companies that went through every one of these phases. And, and how did this work out five years later? Okay, with, you know, 100 integrators from the cloud vendor or the integrator of our choice, you know, hundreds to thousands of proofs of concept. Okay, and it was kind of one disaster after another. So I regard going through this journey over this, say, decade, uh, I am quite, actually quite confident, and I'll give Pat House credit for this line, and I think it's, it's really, uh, really thoughtful. You know, never in the history of information technology has so much been invested to generate so little economic return. I mean, it's a complete, unmitigated disaster. And so now we get to this area of digital transformation, which is where we are here. And, you know, as you go through this process, you know, we, we look, you know, this is, this is the stages they have to go through. Now, I am not sure it's possible to short circuit this, okay? I think you have to live this, every stage of it, okay, in order to get done. I think you have to go through the stage where the CIO looks the CEO in the eye and he or she has you know, 30,000 programmers in Bangalore and you know, how hard can this be? You know, I can build it, trust me. I think you, maybe you have to go through every one of these stages. So I think as you think about your projects, you want to think where you are, okay? Now, if, you're, you know, if you've made it through all of this, you know, here's my business card, my cell number's on it, and I, you know, I'm available across the hall to talk, okay? And if you haven't done this, you probably, if you haven't made it yet, you probably got to go through all, you got this pain. Now, the exception is those of you who are here from the United States government, okay? I mean, it's okay for a private enterprise to do this. Worst case, they get bought by somebody else, they replace the CEO, it's not the end of the world, okay? Okay, but as it relates to DOD, okay, if DOD goes to this, we all gotta learn Mandarin, okay? <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding, okay? So, well, so DOD could not do this, okay? And a lot of our friends from DOD are here, and um, so please don't, if you're in DOD, don't do this. Everybody else, kind of decide where you are, okay, and, okay, and now you know kind of where you're going, and when you get, when, 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 we, when you made it through this fifth stage, you know, give us a call, we can help you out. And, uh, Acceptance! I accept! Hold it, hold it Earl. You finish, you <laughs> Okay, so what has this been about? I mean, these, I mean, so what we're doing now is really, really exciting. We are delivering very, very substantial economic and social benefit in short periods of time. Okay, we're doing it. Shell, Shell's generating order of, you know, 
two billion dollars in economic benefit this year. We're talking billions of dollars, guys. Okay, and now 5.5 billion euros this year in economic benefit. You know, some of you have done, been on some sales calls before, and you know, as difficult as it might be for you to believe, I've been on a couple sales calls too. Okay, and the, um, you know, when you're in the boardroom, okay, with the CEO and the board of directors and the chief digital officer, talking about one, two, three, four, five, six billion euros in economic benefit annually, okay, and they believe that to be true, that's not a bad place to start a meeting. Okay. But the organizations we're gonna hear from, you know, Shell, we're gonna hear from Bank of America, we're gonna hear from Lion Del Basel, we're gonna hear from Cargill, we're gonna hear from DOD, okay, the United States government, they're all here to share their stories on how they do this. You know, the, this story at Shell is nothing, it's nothing short of remarkable. You know, where these guys have brought, you know, 23 assets live in the last four years. And an asset for these guys isn't a pump, Okay, or a valve, they do that too. They do tens of thousands of those, 10,000 10, of those. Okay, um, but an asset is something like Pernus. I don't know if you know what Pernus is. Pernus is the largest refinery okay, in Europe. They process, I believe, a half a billion barrels of oil a day. So this asset would be the equivalent of, say, 10 aircraft carriers. Okay, 10 aircraft carriers, I think, is the number of aircraft carriers we have in the United States of America. Okay, there's a, there's a size of this asset that, the, that these guys are probably 23 assets at scale. This is scary. Or, or a noop, we'll talk about Lion Del Basel. And um, so they're here to share the stories. And of course, you know, the, 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 the highest award in the private sector for excellence in enterprise AI, AI applications is awarded by Constellation Research. It's called the Supernova Award. And the winner of that last year was, um, in 2020, was Shell. Bank of America, where you hear about this, for what these guys are doing in cash management. Uh, Lion Del Basel and Noop is gonna talk about what these guys, these, these, I tell you, these guys are the masters of the universe at digital transformation. So I would do not miss the opportunity to talk with them. Um, Cargill, this is, about, this is about distribution of protein. This is about feeding the world. Um, so, what have we done? We built this, we've figured out how to use this model-driven architecture to dramatically accelerate uh, the uh, design, development, provision, and operation of these extraordinary large-scale enterprise AI applications, small-scale, medium-scale, and large-scale, in DOD, okay, in health, okay, in, 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 in supply chain, in manufacturing, okay, in telecommunications. Um, and and in this architecture, we provide all of, the, all of the services necessary and sufficient to design, develop, provision, and operate these applications. What are these services? You need data fusion, right? We need to aggregate structured data, non-structured data, telemetry, voice, you know, you know, a federated image. We need to keep that image current in near real time. And then we need to process those data at their, as they arrive. And the velocity of these data can some of these applications when we're dealing with like, you know, hypersonics for the Missile Defense Agency where the stuff is coming at us at like 25 times the speed of sound, that's pretty high velocity, okay? This would be what we call a supply chain problem. And uh, um, so then we need all of the services necessary, you know, to, you know, machine learning services, encryption in motion, encryption at rest, access control, uh, queuing, ETL, uh, 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 the ability to develop machine learning models, manage the pipelines, data visualization, uh, application development tools. So we've done that in one package where we provide all the services. And we did, did we build all that stuff ourselves? Is that roughly, you know, all in investment in talking to clients and supporting the infrastructure and doing the R&D? It's like a billion dollar effort. And I realize for some of you guys, this is like, again, I know some of you organizations here are, was a hundred billion dollar company. There's, you know, there's, $130 billion company here. There's a, there's a, a, well, Shell is like close to 300 billion, I think. And then there's, you know, US government, which I, as far as I can tell is infinite these days. You just need, <laughs> need another trillion dollars, they just print it. Uh, uh, so, sorry. Uh, uh, um, but this is very real money. And 
Now, now think about this. Did we really build every? So the beauty of this isn't all the individual components, and did we? It's the orchestration layer and the type system that holds these things together. Okay. Did we build all of this ourselves, each of these components? No. I mean, why would we build a relational database in 20, you know, 10? We did that in 1980. And in you know, 2010, when we started this, there's like 15 really high quality relational databases in the market. Use one. We don't care which relational database you use. Some of the components we did build ourselves. Data fusion, absolutely, we did that. Pipeline management, absolutely, we did that. How about the ability to develop machine learning models. Now, why would we do that? You have Jupyter Notebooks and Python. That's what everybody wants to use. So we integrate that. So we, so um, for data virtualization, what's data virtualization? Data virtualization is about taking very large sets of data that we have in some organizations. With some people yesterday with a, or last week with DOD, I think we were dealing with 650 petabytes of data. This was a big data set. Okay, and you, so if you want to manipulate that, that, that data set and build machine learning models on a computer that only has two gigabytes of memory, you need to, this product, something called virtualization. So there we use open source components, something called Spark. So this, the, the, the beauty of it, so the question is, how do we compete with these things? And, and, and the point is, we don't compete with any of them. They're basically all partners. These are all, these are all piece parts. And organizations that want to use any of these piece parts, no harm, no foul. And you know, let's take a look at this, like Snowflake. How do we compete with Snowflake? What would we want to compete with Snowflake for? I mean, Snow, what is Snowflake? Snowflake is basically a platform independent data store with a SQL interface that's really good for big data. It's a great product. I think it's a great company. And the management team is really talented. I suggest these guys will. I mean, they are hitting a long ball, and they, they will, uh, they, we expect that they will continue to do so. Now, you have asked us to integrate with Snowflake because you have investments in Snowflake that you want to take advantage of, or you, think, you see this as the next generation of persistence. So you instructed us, and so you will see in the product that we're releasing, okay, today, that we have built tight integrations with Snowflake. So you can just drop Snowflake right into where that persistence layer was. No harm, no foul, and you're just up and running with Snowflake. Or maybe Databricks. How do we compete with Databricks? We don't compete with Databricks. I mean, Databricks is a, what is Databricks? Databricks is a virtualization technology. I talked about that. It was developed by a project called Amp Lab at the University of California at Berkeley. It was headed up by a, the chair of the computer science department, a friend of mine by the name of Michael Franklin. Okay, and, and it is a great piece of technology, and they developed this technology called Spark. They put it in the open source computer. Mike Franklin, yes, the Thomas Siebel Chair of Computer Science. Okay, and they, and the, so then Databricks took that and basically provided documentation and support, so they're a commercialized version of Spark. Out of the box with C3, you get Spark. Uh, now the successor to Spark, what's it called, Herman? Ray, uh, the successor to Spark. But for companies that want to use Databricks, like uh, our friends at, uh, uh, our, our friend Dan Jevons at Shell and others, so you have an investment in Databricks, you want to use Databricks, no harm, no foul. We provide tight integ integrations, you just put it in there. So this is entirely, this architecture that you have is entirely future-proofed. Or how about Data Robot? The Data Robot does some, something called AutoML. I don't, won't get into what that is, because you don't really care. Okay, but the point is, okay, if, you want to use, if, you want, if you want to use Data Robot for AutoML or H2O, fine, we have provide tight bindings to it, and you put it in there. Same for Data IQ. I don't even know what it does. I know that some of you want, don't, I don't care what it does. Okay, you're the customer, you ask us to jump, and we say, oh, hi, and so it, so this is how it works. Amazon SageMaker, who wants to use Amazon SageMaker? Um, Cargill, Cummins, one of these guys, okay? And, uh, okay, uh, okay, Azure ML, SaaS, a lot of you have a large, large SaaS investment. SaaS is a pretty good, I think, 1980 technology that a lot of people have you know, a lot of investments in. Okay, and you, you want to be able to leverage those investments. And, and it, it, the stuff works, right? It works, use it. So the point is, in this journey, you have developed artifacts. Everybody has developed artifacts that work. Or there's some new technology, and they want to, these might be data aggregates. 
There might be little pieces of data lake. There might be big pieces of data lake. Could be in Pivotal, could be in HTML, could be in S3 Bucket. Use it. And, we put it, and then we allow you to put it to work at enterprise scale. Python, no harm, no foul, use Python. Everybody does. Jupyter Notebooks, everybody uses it. TensorFlow, no problem. You want TensorFlow? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We'll get TensorFlow. R, Scala, digits. So this, this is, so this, is, this architecture is entirely future-proof. Do you get it? So we don't compete against any of that stuff. They all solve like 100. Some of these are good products. I know some of them are great products. In the case of Snowflake, I think it might be something pretty substantial. Databricks, I think they might have done something pretty substantial. The, the, the services coming out of the cloud vendors, like Google, BigTable, BigQuery, Vertex, I mean, this is like really great stuff that, you, that, you, that many of you want to take advantage of. And we completely enable that. Okay, and when you build these applications, an application on this platform, either whether it comes from us or whether you build it yourself, this application will run without modification on the Google Cloud, on the Azure Cloud, on the AWS Cloud, on the, on the, on the, on the IBM Cloud, on the Edge, or on bare metal. Pretty neat trick. This would be an example of Shell. So Shell wanted to use Databricks, Shell wanted to use Alteric, Shell wanted to use Power BI. No harm, no foul. Yes, sir, you want it, we provide it. We are in the customer service business. So, this is how this works. And we would argue, when we're looking at $5.5 .5 billion in annual economic benefit, now, I mean, there are a number of companies. So there's some friends of mine here from Atlanta, okay, that were about to put together their plan to get order of a billion dollars in economic benefit. And I would argue that never in the history of information technology uh, has information technology yielded such great economic and social benefit in such a short period of time. So in the course of this today, we have built, I think, 42 turnkey enterprise applications for AML, for supply network risk, for stochastic optimization of the supply chain, for demand forecasting, for CRM. And you can expect this application footprint to you know, double and then quadruple in the years to come. And so this is the journey. Again, I don't know whether it's possible to, you know, you know and, and where we, you know, we encounter customers that are building the data lake or they're in their digital strategy. And we don't try to like convince anybody to like do anything else. It's like, go do it. You know, you have a thousand people trying to build this thing in some big science project on Azure. I mean, good luck. It would give us a call in a few years. And that's been kind of how it is. So, but those of you who have made it through, then if you're there, we, we can help. Version 8, okay, this is a, this version 8 represents God knows how many man years of work. I think 600 man years of work, I think. Person years of work, sorry. Um, uh, three to five years of engineering. It's a complete re-architecture of the product, and it is in response to exactly what you have asked us to do in the last three years. So we are here. Uh, we are here to listen to you. We are here to serve you. Okay. And so as we as we as we t as we unfold version eight, and you decide, you give us instructions on what you want us to do next on the roadmap. I will ask you to please be very careful what you ask for, because we're probably going to do it, OK? And so we are here to listen. We're here to learn. We're here to listen about what we got right, what we need to tweak. And so, so this has is, this is been a massive effort on the part of a very talented group of people to do everything they can uh, to assure that your projects are successful. So we're, we really look forward to your feedback on this. Uh, it has been, uh, this, it's a remarkable piece of technology. Uh, I can tell you um, this now, my fourth decade in the information technology industry, that it is, um, you know, it, it was unimaginable when I began that we would be working on projects this difficult, 
this challenging, this exciting, uh, with this much um, uh, social and economic benefit. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is um, the, a, person, a privilege, an honor, and the professional experience of a lifetime to, to be able to work with you on these projects. And on behalf of the 800 and some odd employees at C3, the C3 Board of Directors, and the C3 management team, we thank you for that opportunity.